I began playing drums very badly. <laughs> and then I got good. Um, no, I started to play drums when I was... Uh, I was given a drum when I was three years old. Uh, and I remember that. One drum, toy drum. Uh, but I, I loved it so much that by the time I was five, my uncles made me a little drum kit with two pieces of wood like this. And I had a pole with a cymbal, a pole with a tambourine, a pole with a drum, you know. And uh, it f folded up, put it in a suitcase, and I had that till I was about nine or ten. And then when I was 12 years old, I made the ultimate sacrifice and I sold my brother's train set. I always thought it was my train set, but it's, it, was, it was actually his train set. He just told me about four years ago. Um, but I sold that, and my mother and father put the other half that I got, you know, I don't know how much I got, maybe 20 pounds for the train set, and they put the other 20 pounds, and I bought a drum kit. And uh, from then on, I was deadly serious. I always remember it as being easy. I did nothing else. You know, when other kids were out playing football or, or you know, fighting, I was playing drums. To be respected by other drummers. That was the only ambition I had. And to make a living, to make a living out of it. You know, a career. I thought my life would be pop groups, if I'm lucky, and then maybe um, a big band to people to dance to. And then I'd end my career in an orchestra pit. You know, that's the kind of, the, the stages of being a, a musician that I thought that's the way it would be. But of course, you know, things changed a bit and I don't have to do that now. <laughs> my first, yeah, my first professional group was the Flaming Youth. And uh, we actually, the, the, gr the guys in Flaming Youth had, had a group before that with a different name. Uh, but Flaming Youth, we actually had a record out with Flaming Youth, which was the first time we'd been in a studio, so that was, that was the first serious thing. One of my oldest friends, um, Ronnie Carroll, who was in Flaming Youth with me, we both went for the Genesis audition. And he thought he'd got it, and he thought I hadn't. And in fact, I got it, and he didn't. But yes, that audition was... Um, I got there early, and I listened to other drummers make mistakes. So I learned by their mistakes. There was a period when, when I, you know, uh, Fusion was, was in vogue, you know, and I had Brand X, and, well, I didn't have it, I was a member of Brand X, it wasn't my group. But um, I brought some of that into Genesis, and What Gorilla was one of my favourite tunes from Wind and Wuthering, but that was based on a drum pattern, which was... Uh, We wrote the song around that. It was a mixture of things because it was just straight ahead. Which is straight ahead, kind of John Bonham Ringo almost. Um, but then in the in the middle, um Forget it now. But basically, it went through all those kind of different moods. I sang in my school group. We had a singer, a lead singer, but I also sang from the from the drums, you know, with a microphone. Um, and I sang in Flaming Youth. I, I sang all the way through, really, but I never came out front with somebody else playing the drums, and that was the big change, and that obviously didn't happen until Peter Gabriel left. Um, and really, I only, I only started singing because nobody else, we couldn't find anybody else, really, that we liked. And so I got the job. It was luck, yeah, or bad luck. I mean, it was a divorce, so that kind of led to that. Um, it, it led me, it, 
what it did, it led me into a situation where to occupy my time, uh, I started to write songs and I started to learn how to operate my home studio. And um, I started writing songs and I started recording those songs and then after I'd finished doing all that, someone suggested putting it out as a record. But I never meant to make a solo record. It was just me having fun at home, really. The drums just came in. And then when we got to the studio, um, we were playing around with the sound in the studio, me, Hugh Padgham and myself. And um, it came up, you know, it's all been a pack of lies. Sorry about that. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that was just what I played on that take. You know, earlier takes, I probably played. I can feel it, you know. But at that particular take, it was. And that became uh, the noose around my neck. <laughs> it became the trademark. Yeah. But it was just luck, just luck. But it did, it did uh, introduce a sound, which actually I had, I had played on Peter Gabriel's record before that. We went into the studio to record some songs for his third album. And uh, one day we were in the studio and uh, I was playing, just giving them some tom toms, you know. And he was fiddling around with some gates, noise gates, which like, ah, ah. And I suddenly hear the. And Peter said, he put his finger on the button and he said, um, just, what's that? I said, it's nothing, just fooling around. He said, give me that for 10 minutes. So I did 10 minutes and he, uh, he put this song that he had, Intruder, he put that on top of that rhythm. I know something about that started to launch. I mean, everybody started play wanting that sound on their records and, and drum machines, sampling machines. They all took those samples, ga 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 you know, and Intruder and Biko. Biko was another one I played on of Peter's. And uh, they took those samples and, you know, they became um, on everybody's record then. You could have Phil Collins on every record if you wanted it to. Not something that people would want to do now, but then they did. I don't look like a stereotype rock star, you see, so, so therefore I, I can't be something I, I'm, I'm not. So I've always been... Um, I've, I've always found that kind of image thing a little embarrassing, so I've never, I've never cultivated it really. I, I'm just, I just me, which is not a lot really. <laughs> and one would be a hypocrite if one was to say that one, you know, hasn't done this and done that and tried that and tried that, but um, really, quite tame by comparison to. We were always too embarrassed with Genesis, you know. Um, we always got we always got guys at our gigs, you know, guys with hats and long rank, with lots of albums under their arm. You know, hello, Phil, can you sign this? You know, we didn't get lots of girls at our concerts. <laughs> that particular avenue of pleasure was sealed off. The Beatles were my guys, you know, fantastic. They wrote wonderful songs, wonderful songs. Um, but Ringo was a great drummer. I always say, you know, on things like Strawberry Fields Forever or Day in the Life. Like, um, I read the news today of a... The English army had just won the war. No one did, no one played like that. Only he could play like that. Well, I can play like that now. But only because he played like that. He invented it.
George Martin asked me to, to do it. I mean, he asked me to, he said, we, I'd like you to play Golden Slumbers. You know? But that's... That's the kind of, that's the kind of drum solo you can sing. What is techno music? I mean, I, I, my son plays me some stuff that, I, if I call something techno music, he says, no, no, man, this is trip hop, you know, or this is acid, acid folk, mystic. This is, you know, progressive jazz, or I, I don't know. I don't know about the names. There are too many names, you know, too many names and not enough music. I wouldn't rule out the possibility of, of me, at some point in my life, working with Tony and Mike again. Not as Genesis, you know, or Peter, yeah, or Steve. I mean, any group of us, we like each other and we like to write with each other, but we don't want to necessarily call it Genesis, you know, I mean, we may write something together because we enjoy writing, but it won't necessarily be called Genesis. I've left Genesis. Watch my, watch my mouth. I've left Genesis.